cerebellum, in which is shown that the cerebellum, while having more neurons than the cerebrum, does not generate consciousness. Most of what happens simmers beneath the surface, unseeable by the mind. Most of the action unrolls in murky waters, said Frick, and threw the door wide open. Inside the room, in front of a large canvas, a man was standing with the legs wide apart, and his hand shook when he moved the brush. I know the painter, said Galileo to Frick. It is the great Poisson. I know the painting too. See, Janus indicates the instant between past and future, the instant of conscious present. On the right, time marks the beats of music on the zither, the rhythm of dance and life, and in the middle, the dancing men and women represent the seasons and the cycle of time. Time is not circular, my dear Galileo, replied a figure emerging from behind the canvas. Perhaps that of the planets is, but not the time of men. It was the Pope's doctor, Rome's Protomedicus. Look at the Puti. The right one holds the hourglass. Inexorable is the passage of time, it says. The left one says that consciousness is short-lasting, like a bubble of soap. Galileo did not reply. Instead he whispered something into the doctor's ear. Trembling? exclaimed the doctor. Of course I know. Poisson has been this way for some time now. His brush draw clearly has suffered. But rest assured, his health is fine. I've seen another case like him. A young woman with the same kind of trembling, who kept her legs apart when standing. When she died of childbirth, I examined her brain. In the back of her skull, under the nape of the neck, something was missing. There was no cerebellum. That furrowed brain that looks like a small cabbage or like the tree of life. Our Poisson, too, must have lost his cerebellum. Perhaps it was a stroke. It seems that all it does, this beautiful little brain, is to make sure our gait stays elegant and our hand shakes not. Quite right, said Frick, stepping forward though it does other refined things. It keeps track of our movements much faster than we can, and it corrects and stabilizes them. It is a piece of brain as intricate as the cerebrum. In fact, it has an even larger number of nerve cells. And like the cerebrum, it receives signals from the senses and controls our actions with perfect accuracy. Galileo was thinking, the canvas was grand, the subject noble and indeed replete with meaning but it was singularly immobile. Although it was about time, time seemed frozen, everywhere pointers to time and movement, even a dance, but real time, the time of the pulse, the time of the pendulum, that time was missing, it was as if the painter's pulse and pendulum were stuck. Right then the painter turned toward them. We must not judge by our senses alone, but by reason, he said with a strange, wavering voice. My hand m may tremble, but my mind does not for things perceive their being irrespected of accident. Go, go beyond the surface and complete the idea. The cone, the cylinder, the sphere, he paused, took a breath, and said, The purest are the idea of good and that of truth. It's just that, and here he paused again, It's just that those are far too hard to paint. Well said, said Frick. Many of the neural systems in the cerebral cortex do just this. They learn to predict what remains constant in the world, despite the seeming onslaught of constant change. They paint a scene of what the world should be, much as you paint it, with scarce regard for all the changing details our senses bring in most of the time. So in our consciousness, the cone's shape stays the same, though when we see it from different angles, the images formed onto our eyes are different entirely. So the color of ripe fruit stays the same under the warm light of sunset, and the cold one of lightning, though the light reflected by its surface doesn't. Yes, said Freak, the scene in which we live is an abstraction, 
experience must be make-believe, a painting by some clever master. Reality may swirl in whirlwinds of irrelevant, superficial change, but information is in what is constant and general and deep. That kind of information is what consciousness requires. Isn't that also what art is trying to capture? Asked Trick. I paint what I know, not what I see, said Poisson. But what if you see what you know? Asked Trick. Why don't we leave alone all these abstractions and examine the trembling that bothers our Poisson, said the doctor. Quite right, said Frick. Poisson's cerebral cortex, the one that paints invariants and abstractions, imagines and predicts his view of the world. The one that generates his consciousness surely is still all right. It is his cerebellum that has failed, a system that cares not about constant, the general and the deep, but needs to know exactly how things are, here and now, in exhausting accurate detail, to calculate how far fingers have to open to grasp the brush, reckon how far to move the eyes to reach the canvas edge, how much the arm must stiffen to steady his stretched hand, how much the trunk must tighten when the shoulder lifts to draw. Such systems do not need to paint a grand scene of the world. They do not worry about what it all might mean. Their many parts don't need to talk to each other. They only need to do their special private job to do it right and fast, oblivious to the rest. Uncaring of the essence, you cannot have a perfect grip and grasp the universe all the same. You cannot grasp the universe indeed, intervened the doctor, turning toward Poisson. Then let's make sure at least that everything else is working. My dear Poisson, anything wrong besides the tremor and the gait? How are your sight, your hearing and your touch, your smell and taste? Has your grip stayed strong? The painter scrutinized the physician. Though you may be a great doctor, your eyes is not as good as mine. For all is fine with me. I see colors and shapes, I hear the sounds, I t touch and taste as I always did in the great theater of my mind. The p p place is still going on. True doctor, there are things I cannot do, I cannot play, I cannot dance, and so I paint them. But if the gate of my thought may be lame, Doctor, it still walks faster and further than yours. He pointed to a finished canvas. Tell me this, Galileo. Is there more truth in his dissections or in my art? But Galileo was not paying attention. His mind was weighing the cerebrum against the cerebellum. When the cerebrum is destroyed, a universe is destroyed. But when the cerebellum dies, nobody is dead. Copernicus was gone, Poisson was painting. So the cerebrum is necessary for consciousness, the cerebellum not. Yet the cerebellum is as much brain as the cerebrum, as rich and well endowed, and trades as much with the world outside. You told me the cerebrum was like a great city, he said, looking at Frick. But so is the cerebellum. Indeed, answered Frick. Now that I think of it, I am not sure myself why consciousness should be so fuzzy. The cerebellum does not lack nerve cells or any other ingredient that makes the brain a brain. Perhaps it is the building plan, he said after a brief reflection. Cells in the cerebrum are all connected directly or through a few intermediaries, as I have told you. They talk to each other all the time. Cells in the cerebellum may lack the right connections. What they receive they process and send out, but cannot talk to each other. My studies may be outdated, said the doctor, but what you say reminds me of an old tale, the tale of the two cities. Listen, he said. Once there was a king who reigned over a great city. He was rich and powerful, but was afraid of what people would say to each other. He knew the citizens did abide the law and did respect their king. But, thought the king, 
How could he know what they said to each other when nobody saw them? So he hired some trusted men and had them keep an eye on the citizens and write down carefully what they heard. But that did not work well. Nobody had time to read the reports, though a large department had been created just for that. And even so, how could one know whether the citizens said one thing and meant another? Besides, who knew what happened when the informers went to sleep? So the king had them do the shifts, and when one went to work with blurry eyes, the other went to bed with aching arms for too much writing. And he made sure the informers themselves would not be left unchecked. So he set up in great secret a second tier of informers, who informed on the first tier. That will do for the moment, thought the king. But soon the king realized that he had been careless. The informers would inform when people gathered in the streets, but who could know what passed between husband and wife, and not just at the dinner table, but when they huddled in the hideout of their beds, or when a mother told her daughter the secrets of marriage, what other secret might she confide? There did not seem to be a solution. The king convened his counsellors, and none of them had any good idea. But then the court just raised his hand. His name was Maudolus, and made a suggestion the king thought was foolproof. So the next day the king's masons and carpenters went to work, cheerful because their wages had doubled, and in little time carried out the king's orders. When the oldest mason had finished his last assignment, the king surveyed the city from the highest window of the highest tower and was happy with what he saw. For everybody from the oldest mason to all other masons and all the carpenters, from every craftsman to every landlady or maid, from every child to every granny, everybody was safely confined within his own cubicle. Each cubicle had thick walls, strong because there were no windows. Inside the box was everything one needed, a bed and a light and running water. And food was provided every day through a little door, so small that even children could not slide across. The jester had truly thought of all. The king's dogs would carry everything to and from the castle. So through the little door back went the work done by the craftsmen. The miniature sculptures for which the city was famous. The knives forged by the blacksmiths. The jewels fashioned by the goldsmiths. The clothes embroidered by the needle workers. Even the food the maids had cooked. All was good and safe, thought the king. And indeed, he heard no complaints. He could hear instead the industrious hammering of the craftsmen in their boxes, and the clangs of pots and pans made by an eager cook in her cubicle. Otherwise, the city was veiled with pleasant silence. Just as the jester had said, now he could stop worrying about what people would say, as there was no way they could talk to each other. And so he prepared for a long, serene reign, and from high above he watched the endless plain, dotted with innumerable cubicles, and inside each cubicle one of his subjects was hard at work. But then one day the jester raised his hand again, saying he had had a dream, that an army had entered the city, encountering no resistance. How could the enemy be stopped if the citizens could not speak to each other? What? said the king annoyed. It is enough that each citizen receives his orders from the castle, without a word being wasted. What do citizens need to talk about? Sire, said the jester, if one who spots the enemy cannot alert the others, call them all to arms, to form a mighty legion where there is great need, we cannot survive, not against an enemy who, I have heard, devours our dogs alive, raw from the bone. So they went, the king and the jester down to the city, to the vast plain, and stopped at the very first cubicle. The king knocked at the small door and ordered it open, but nobody would answer. The king tore down the little door with his sabre, and when they entered the cubicle, torn and dirty, they saw the old mason sitting on a large stone. What happened, old mason? they asked. I've lost my mind, he answered. All this time alone in my cell, I must have lost my mind. Has the entire city gone mad? asked the king. The city? exclaimed the old mason. When I built the boxes, 
I called our best carpenters and blacksmiths. Oh, they were such master builders. For each stall, sire, for each one of them, uh, they built an ingenious machine made of wood and iron, which did the simple deeds each citizen must perform for you. Uh, a machine that did everything it had to do without exchanging a word with anybody. So for the cook, they built a food processing machine. Uh, for the cordwainer, an automatic cobbler. For the glassmith, an automatic blower. And for the butcher, a self-propelled guillotine with a carver attached. And for the priest... Then what is everybody doing? asked the king without letting the mason finish. Are they idling in their boxes while the machines do all the work? Because now we need all their help against the enemy, the enemy that is devouring our dogs alive. But you won't find them, sir. None of them, said the old mason. They all left. Long ago they left and built themselves a new town, yes, where all the time they do nothing but talk. They shout and scheme, trade and argue, and do all sort of things together. Stage merry plays and sing loud shores. And there, there, said the old mason, who was beginning to make all kinds of grimaces. There they must still. And he stood up tall, and it seemed that his cheeks were overblown and close to bursting. There! And he could not suppress it further. There! He burst out. They must all be laughing, laughing about you. Like happy drunkards, they are laughing, and their laughter fills the town hall day and night. And no sooner has a joke reached the end of the hall than another yoke starts on the side and causes an even louder roar and they sing together and the songs keep changing but they are all about you lewd songs and unspeakable things are sung and those who scream the loudest are the schoolgirls and old men like me chuckle so hard that no breath is left in their chest. What would I know, sire? I am just an old crazy mason. And he sat down again. But one thing, sire, is sure, he said in a sombre tone. Empty are the cells, and the soul has vanished from the old city. So, thought Galileo, there are two great cities in the brain, the cerebrum, where citizens of all kinds and manners can argue with each other, and as they speak, decide on things together, and the cerebellum, a city even more populous, but there instead everyone lives alone, without talking to anyone, in his own cell, taking care of his business. That, thought Galileo, may be why consciousness lives in the cerebrum, the great bustling metropolis, the lively democracy, and the cerebellum is an immense, silent prison. Notes The painting is Poisson's dance to the music of time, which is at the Wallace Collection in London. Poisson did develop a tremor late in his years, although an analysis of his brush stroke suggests that it may have resulted from Parkinson's disorder rather than from a cerebellar problem. See The Movement Disorder of Nicola Poisson, 1594-1665 by Patrick Haggard and Sam Rogers. Movement Disorders, Year 2000. The explosive speech of Poisson is characteristic of some cerebellar disorders. Poisson's self-portrait is at Louvre, and so is his mysterious Arcadian shepherds, very much the ideal painting of an idea. Poisson's notion of art has clear affinities with Plato's, but so has the organization of the cerebral cortex, as briefly illustrated by Frick. From a flurry of signals that bombard them, 
neurons in the highest parts of the cortex have learned to extract the constant, the general and the deep. The higher one goes, the more invariant to irrelevant change neuronal responses become, the more abstract and the more behaviorally meaningful. And perhaps some neurons force such categories back into the world to predict what it might be like. We see what we can imagine, and perhaps that is why we can see anything at all. Consciousness lives on such constancies, abstractions and depths, and sometimes art does too, or at least Poisson seems to think so. By contrast, it seems that tasks that require rapid adjustments are of local interest and do not require a vast context of knowledge remain outside our border of consciousness. Such tasks can be executed automatically and are carried out by dedicated modules of the brain that can perform their job fast, well and in relative isolation. Indeed, when there is no need for arguments and discussion, when things are automatic and repetitive, they can move into the assembly line. The great lively city of the cortex gives way to the efficient cubicles of the cerebellum. As Frick notes, though, there may be such dedicated systems even in the cerebral cortex. As studied by Goodale and Milner in Sight Unseen, Oxford University Press 2004, and others, patients with lesions in some parts of the cortex lose the ability, for example, to shape and size the opening of their fingers correctly to grasp an object, but have no problem reporting consciously the object's shape and size. On the other hand, patients with lesions in other parts of the cortex lose the ability to perceive shape and size, but their fingers go on seeing shape and size and correctly adapt their grip. 